Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a great session. I want to second Catherine's comments. Uh, we heard from Bob about the challenges that policymakers have with communicating risk when they don't understand the biggest risk. Uh, I'm going to add the point that managers don't understand those things either in the context of water resources and, of course, other things. Um, that relates to the cognitive issues that, that Stefan addressed. Uh, we work with our existing tools, but that may not be enough. And again, in the water area, our managers work with existing tools, but climate change may pose some challenges outside of their experience or outside of the ability of their tools to manage. Um, and Catherine talked about the importance of preparing for these things and raised a question about how and offered some practical thoughts. And, and if I can get Catherine to come and work with California water managers to solve our water problems, that would be a huge advantage. Let me just leave that at that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, climate change and extreme hydrologic events. I'm going to talk a little bit about the science of what we know, uh, and what we expect, and what we see, and then a little bit about the policy about how we might want to adapt. Um, some of this is going to come from the National Climate Assessment that was mentioned earlier, some work that we've been doing, uh, some global work from the IPCC on extreme hydrologic events. Uh, I like to talk about water in the context of climate change in part because I'm a water guy, but also in part because the hydrologic cycle is the climate cycle. Um, as we change the climate, we're going to affect pretty much every aspect of the hydrologic cycle from the natural perspective, but also from the perspective of the infrastructure that we build, the hydrologic, uh, the dams that we build to store wet years so that we can use it in dry years, the infrastructure we build for water treatment and management. And I'm going to make some comments about some of the infrastructure issues as well. Uh, this is a, a graph that shows contiguous U.S. average temperatures over time over the last 100 and, uh, what is it, 118 years or so, uh, showing the trend in temperatures in the U.S. Uh, we saw some of this locally already. Uh, already we know the news is coming out that this may be the hottest year on record globally. It's without a doubt going to be the hottest year on record in California uh, in, in the uh, uh, 2014 time frame. But we also see these changes in precipitation trends. And again, Catherine showed a graph I'm going to show also for changes in precipitation patterns in the U.S. Uh, this is the same trend for the continental United States. Uh, we know that a hotter planet means more evaporation, more uh, moisture in the atmosphere. The observations suggest that, theory suggests that, uh, models suggest that, and that's the way we're moving. This is the graph that, that Catherine showed showing we're already observing changes in extreme precipitation events in the United States, something that was projected many years ago by theory, uh, projected by model output as well, and now we're, we're seeing in observations. Uh, this shows basically the percent increases in precipitation falling in the heaviest 1% of daily events uh, over the last uh, four or five or six decades. We know that one of the things that's going to occur and is already occurring is changes in snowfall and snowmelt dynamics. Uh, some of this was the work I did years ago in California. Uh, higher temperatures, even if there's no particular change in precipitation, means more rain and less snow. Uh, in the Sierra Nevada, in the Rocky Mountains, it means what does fall is snow, melts faster, and runs off earlier, so we see a change in the timing of runoff. So snow melt dynamics is going to be an important part of water management challenges for policymakers and water managers. Uh, we know the glaciers are disappearing. This is going to be an issue not just for natural ecosystems, but for downstream water infrastructure and populations that live downstream. There's been a lot of discussion about this in the context of the Himalayas, uh, but it's true for other parts of the world as well. There's been some estimates of changes in runoff, and ironically and unfortunately, some of the most significant decreases in projected runoff are in those regions, in this case of the United States, that we already know are warm and dry where there are water shortages and competition over water resources. This shows basically very significant projected in decreases in runoff in the Colorado River Basin in particular and the southwestern United States in general. And for some of these basins, these are already over allocated basins. These are basins even without climate change. We have very serious water management problems. Uh, and when you impose Wow, I didn't even touch anything that time. Uh, 
when you impose climate change on these challenges, it makes, it makes current difficulties even worse. Uh, when you put these things together, you get water stress of different kinds. There are lots of different indices out there that people use to measure water stress. This is one that compares the amount of runoff versus the amount of water demanded or used in a region when you put together all of those factors. And again, it shows what we already know from model projections and from existing challenges, which is that the warm, dry, arid west uh, is a place where we're going to have serious problems. But I want to talk about some things that we don't tend to think about. We think about water availability, we think about stress, we think about changes in runoff, but water is a big issue. Um, another piece of this puzzle is the issue of sea level rise. It turns out that sea level rise can have impacts on coastal ecosystems where fresh water and salt water mix. So aquatic and uh, uh, salt and fresh water ecosystems are going to be affected by sea level rise. That's a water challenge in many ways. Uh, we draw water from coastal aquifers, and as sea levels go up, we're going to see more penetration of salinity into coastal aquifers, uh, uh, even when we're not overdrafting those aquifers, which unfortunately we are. So sea level rise is a fresh water challenge for many communities as well. And there are other issues. There's a very strong connection, it turns out, between sea surface temperature and cholera in the, in the um, Sea of Bengal and in, the, in, in Western Bengal and in India. So connections between temperature, connections between uh, sea surface temperatures, connections with public health are especially water-related diseases are relevant. Uh, here's another one. We did a study at the Pacific Institute a few years ago doing high-resolution mapping of the coast of California from the Oregon border down to the Mexican border looking at the implications for infrastructure, populations at risk, and so on, and one of the things that people don't tend to think about much, but is apparently a special vulnerability, is wastewater treatment plants. We build our wastewater treatment plants at the coast because what we do is we collect wastewater, we treat it to some standard, and then we throw it away by typically dumping it in the ocean. That's a water policy issue. I, I won't get into the very interesting questions about reusing wastewater in California. There are some wonderful policy challenges there. But it turns out for the Bay Area alone, there are 22 wastewater treatment plants within a meter of sea level rise that are vulnerable to the sea level rises we expect over the coming decades that will either have to be protected by building seawalls, uh, they'll have to be modified by raising outflow structures, they'll have to be abandoned and moved uh, if the costs, depending on the, the, the options that are available to water managers. And it's safe to say that water managers aren't thinking about this now. And maybe in Catherine's, from Catherine's example, explaining these kinds of challenges and threats to water managers helps raise issues that might, they, they might not otherwise be thinking about. Broadly speaking, uh, we worry about extreme events. Obviously, we worry about averages, but again, from Stephen's talk, uh, we worry especially about extreme events. We don't fully understand the implications of extreme events. The picture on the left is from a couple of weeks ago. It's the atmospheric river that dumped a huge amount of rainfall on Northern California. This was the sink or swim event that, that Jim mentioned a, a moment ago when he arrived at the airport. We get our precipitation on the western, in the Western United States, not in slow occasional rainfalls, but in extreme events. And we don't fully understand what climate change is going to do to those extreme events, although it, I would note in the last few years, there's been a tremendous increase in a number of very interesting papers looking at changes in sea surface temperature, looking at changes in atmospheric dynamics and pressure systems off the Arctic, and the implications of those kinds of changes for water resources in the western United States and in California in particular. Uh, one comment about the drought, for those of you who saw my talk on um, Tuesday, uh, this is the one slide that you saw. Uh, this is California temperature and precipitation anomalies in terms of 36-month, 36 36 three-year averages uh, for every year going back 119 years. Basically, anything that's above the center line, anything above this line here uh, is a warm anomaly, a warm year out of the last 119 years. Anything below is a cool year. Uh, anything to the right here is a wet year compared to the average. Anything to the, uh, 
to the left is a dry year, and each of the last 119 years of our instrumental record are plotted as a point here. And this is 2014. It's, to, to describe it as an outlier is an understatement. Uh, we're in the midst of a three-year drought, notwithstanding the incredible rains we've had in the last few weeks. Um, interestingly enough, you can't read the years for most of these, but the hot, dry years are up here, and they're the last few decades. Uh, and that's another challenge that we face in thinking about not just drought. We get droughts naturally and floods naturally, but the implications of climate change for those extremes. And then here's another thing that we don't tend to think about. This is work that we're doing at the Pacific Institute. It hasn't yet been released. This is basically hydroelectric generation anomalies uh, over just the last decade or so, about 15 years. Uh, and in the, in the context of increases or decreases in monthly hydro generation uh, from the expected average hydro generation for those months. Uh, what we basically see here, here especially, is the last three years of drought in California, showing that one of the impacts of drought in California is a reduction in hydroelectricity generation. We get less precipitation, less rain and snow, we get less runoff, our reservoirs are drawn down, we get less hydro generation. Now, in fact, it's not just a three-year drought. Uh, Ten of the last 14 years in California have been dry, and there's been a shortfall in hydro generation. What do we do when we get a shortfall in hydro generation? We burn more natural gas. Uh, so there's a climate feedback issue associated with that. Uh, in addition, consumers pay more money. Hydro generation is relatively cheap in California. We burn more natural gas, it's more expensive, consumer rates go up. At the moment, our expectation is just over the last three years, this anomalous drop, this drought-driven drop in hydro generation has cost California ratepayers about $2 billion. That's an impact of drought. It's an impact, potentially, of long-term changes in climate if that's going to affect hydro generation. So that's something else we have to think about. So for the last couple of slides, let me just talk about policy a little bit and the connection between extreme hydrologic events and policy. And I would argue this is not a new issue. Uh, I was on a panel with the American Water Works Association 17 years ago or so, uh, in which, and the American Water Works Association is basically an association of 50,000, 50, 56,000 water utilities around the country. And they concluded then, almost two decades ago, that while water management systems are often flexible, water, water agencies should re-examine water systems design and operating rules under a wider range of climate conditions than traditionally used. And it's the point that was made by earlier speakers. Our system is designed on the assumption, our infrastructure is built on the assumption that tomorrow's climate's gonna look like yesterday's climate. And if there's anything that we know, despite the uncertainties about precision predictions for the next 20 years, it's that that assumption is wrong. It's that the climate's changing and we had better rethink our management strategies under a broader range of scenarios. And yet, we're still not doing that today. So the longer we delay in taking action, the worse will be the impacts, and the greater will be the levels of adaptation that we have to pursue. And I'm not going to get into the debate about mitigation versus adaptation. I think it's pretty obvious we have to do both. But let me just close with some comments about strategies. We have to integrate and coordinate mitigation and adaptation. There are strategies that we can pursue on our energy system and our water system that helps us adapt to unavoidable impacts and yet may help us mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases. And the example I just gave about hydroelectricity, where reductions in hydropower mean burning more natural gas at the moment, is an example of the need to integrate our energy and water uh, as a piece of the puzzle. And I would add we should do this for our food system as well, but that's another talk. We have to evaluate the potential for existing policies to help us adapt. But I would argue that sometimes the existing strategies aren't going to be enough, and we better understand where the existing strategies are insufficient. What doesn't work that we're doing now under new conditions? 
And I, I could give some examples of that, but I won't at the moment given time constraints. But I would simply note that our policy in the past has been build things for water, build infrastructure. And I would argue building things now may not be the right answer. And certainly building things now with the assumptions from yesterday is not the right answer. Maybe we still want to build things, but we had better rethink and integrate climate change into that. Pricing and markets, economics, is an important challenge here, an important tool. We want to manage the system differently, and that's a question of getting water managers involved in the kinds of discussions that Catherine described. We want to regulate the system under certain circumstances, and we want to educate and we want to communicate. And if we're focused on doing one of these things, that's not going to be enough. We have to do them all. Thank you very much. Thank you.